Hey everybody, welcome back to RPG Imaginings. Uh, I was going to mow the lawn this morning, but it started raining the instant that I got out there, so that means it's Pendragon Solo Quest Adventure time! And uh, so that's, of course, a pleasant thing for me. Um, I have my cuppa, uh, Jasmine Pearls. Very excited about it. Um, and so, yeah, let's check out uh, book one of the Pendragon starter set, The Adventure of the Sword in the Stone, a Pendragon 6th edition solo quest adventure. And it starts out here with some basic descriptions of what the setting is like, that this is a conglomeration of all of anything that's been produced for Arthurian literature, and that you should feel free to do what you want to do and play how you want to play within an Arthurian setting. And uh, then as we continue to turn the pages, they do give you the opportunity to not only understand what glory and honor are, I'll read this in a second, but also to customize the little pre-gen character sheet that they have here, right here. And so let's start out by reading uh, this honor and glory section. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit just so that uh, I don't have to do what I've done with past... Um, solo videos if i can just alter the camera angle come on there we go we're doing better glory and honor the measure of all knights is taken by their glory and honor values glory is the measure of a knight's notoriety and fame it only increases with time and it is not tied to the knight's inherent moral character knights like sir agravain or sir bruce sans piti I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, are infamous, infamous for their rotten personalities and questionable behavior, but both achieve high glory values. Honor, on the other hand, may fluctuate quite a bit over the course of a knight's lifetime and is dependent on their behavior. Some actions increase honor, many others decrease it. Honor is a precious commodity and must be closely guarded, for if a knight's honor ever falls too low, they lose their status and place in society. During this adventure, you will keep track of the actions that would normally earn you glory if you were a knight as well as your honor value you do this by placing checks in the boxes next to the indicated skills personality traits and passions each box may only be checked once if you earned a check earlier in the adventure any further instructions to check the box are ignored after completing the adventure you'll find the instructions on how to tally everything up based on your checks and find out what kind of knight your young character will eventually grow up to become there's a section on dealing and taking damage I'm not going to worry about that here right away at the start, given that um, this is going to be, you know, part one of a multi-part episode, most likely. And then it delves into what to do with your character. Now, I have prepared for this video by making all of the character decisions in advance. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to run you through really quickly about uh, what this short section says about characteristics, traits, passions, and skills, and then we're going to delve right into the adventure. And so what I did here is I blew up the example character sheet right here. Well, actually what I did is I, I uh, scanned it and then uh, blew it up and printed it off. So I have like a large version of that character sheet right here. And here's some examples of things that I did. So I named my character Nia because in this setting, gender is irrelevant to your knighthood. You could be uh, male, female, non-binary, whatever you want to be in this setting. Tells you a little bit about the characteristics, which don't work that differently from characteristics in uh, other BRP games, although you'll see that these are fifth values mostly. Uh, Pendragon is a roll under 20 system, so you're going to roll a 20-sided die, and success is if you roll underneath a skill value. We see some of our various other uh, derived stats. Our maximum hit points is 27. And then it starts you out with understanding traits. So bold traits are religious traits. And if a trait is in bold, you start off by assigning uh, a plus three to a trait. So all characteristics start as like a 10-10 split. And then for the ones that are bold traits, you can increase by plus three. And so I decided that Nia was going to be more chaste than lustful, more forgiving than vengeful. 
um, more temperate than indulgent. I always like to give characters some weaknesses as well, though, because that just makes for more uh, fun role playing. So I made her more worldly than spiritual, which be could become a problem in a religious society and more proud than modest. Uh, the game also uh, instructs you to put 15 in Valorous, and so notice how we have a 15 and 5 split here, which all of these traits add up to 20, and the idea being is that if I'm ever asked to test Valorous, I would be shooting for uh, under 15, would be the goal. Um, and then I was able to pick a trait to set at 16 as the trait that I am most well known for, and I selected Merciful. Now, you'll notice that I made some little hash marks here above several skills. I had six additional points that I could divide amongst any of my skills, and so I decided to put three into Energetic and three into Generous so that I could be more energetic and generous than lazy and selfish, and all the rest of my skills are at 10. Sorry, traits, I should say, are at 10. There's a discussion of passions that are open to you. There isn't really any choice of this for this adventure. You get uh, passions of 15 in homage, lord, love, family, hospitality, and honor. And then for skills, it instructs you because you are a, I'm not sure if it's Kimrick or Simrick Knight. I don't know the pronunciation on it. Um, but uh, you get a uh, plus three bonus in charge, horsemanship, and courtesy as a result of that. And then uh, you can also um, uh, roll on a table that allows you to get a plus three bonus in a single skill, selected family characteristics. And I rolled a three to get perceptive, which improves the intrigue skill. And I thought to myself, you know, that sounds pretty cool. And so with the uh, remaining uh, 10 points, and you know what? I think I miscalculated here. And so that's actually a good thing because it means that I get more points. Um, I knew I had a plan for this, but, <laughs> but I failed at my own plan. So what I intended to do here was to put five points in sword to make this <laughs> an 11. Apparently I got, uh, distracted at some point while I was building this last night. And I put three points in awareness to make it an eight an additional two points in Intrigue to make it a 12, and then basically you just sum your base values, which are in parentheses here, with whatever additions you put it in, and that gives you your skills. Uh, oh, one thing that I forgot to mention is that any starred characteristic on the right-hand side here is considered a knightly skill that are valuable for knights. So I'm just going to move my character sheet to the side. Anytime I make a, a skill roll, I'll be referencing that character sheet. And uh, trust me, I'll follow along with the character sheet. So um, you don't have to see it or anything. Oh, T, good. So let's go ahead and start off with the adventure of the sword in the stone. Serector's Manor is built upon the ruins of an ancient hill fort in the country of Penlin. The hall, Sir Ector's place of residence, is a grand two-story stone building with an entrance on the second floor. On this fine autumnal day with the harvest done and the air getting chillier, you are enjoying a brief respite from your duties with your friend and fellow page, Alice. The two of you are sitting near the warmth of the central hearth, playing a game of improvised drafts using river pebbles when the main door to the hall flies open. It is your friend, Arthur, Kay's younger brother, and his fine features are lit up with excitement. He beams at you. Kay wants to do Quintain practice, and I asked if you could join us, and he said yes. You leap to your feet. As a page, you are not allowed to practice martial skills with the squires. Kay, the senior squire of the household, must be feeling magnanimous. The game of drafts forgotten, you and Alice run outside with Arthur. Go to two. The knight is, if nothing else, a mounted warrior, and the knight is most fearsome on the battlefield as a part of the massed mounted lance charge. Against this unstoppable force, few enemies may stand. Learning how to ride your horse into battle takes years of practice. It requires riding at full gallop, holding a heavy shield in one hand and a long wobbly stick in the other, all the while maintaining balance and control of the mount long enough to score a meaningful hit against a target, without falling off afterward. 
Squires practice their aim with the lance using a device called a quintain. These vary in construction from simple to elaborate. Sir Ector's quintain is decidedly the former, but it serves its purpose well enough. A cross beam atop a post is used to hang an iron disc about the size of a man's face. The distance from the ground may be adjusted, but usually, like today, it is hung at the approximate point where a precise hit is likely to unhorse a knight. The idea is to execute a charge with the lance and try to score a direct hit on the disc, which is molded in such a way that only by striking the very center will a sonorous gong sound out. Turning the page to continue to. And we have a lovely little pastoral scene of the small town. Before we continue, let's just read this box right here, Doing the Right Thing. Pendragon often confronts players with dilemmas that are played out using personality traits. The traits on the left-hand side of the column of your character sheet are considered the more positive ones for knights from Britain's mainstream culture and religion. Acting in accordance with these traits is considered befitting a good, Simric Christian knight, but is not always the right thing to do. Behavior that seems advantageous in the moment may come with a hidden cost later on. Conversely, some sacrifices may be made in entirely in vain. Traits of 16 or higher, called famous traits, and for this I had selected merciful, often compel behavior in accordance with that trait unless you roll under the opposing trait. Other times you may wish to be asked to roll against one or two traits to determine a course of action, such as making a valorous roll to confront a terrifying monster, or rolling against temperant and indulgent to see if you overeat at a feast. Over time, acting in accordance with a particular trait raises its value, causing you to act even more so in the future. All right, let's continue with number two. As you run out onto the top stairs landing outside the hall, you see that Kay has set up the quintain and brought a small stack of rebated lances, their normally lethal points dulled with a cloth bundle. Your excitement dims when you see that he has also brought out a mechanical hobby horse, a four-wheeled contraption with a saddle on top, which must be pulled by two others in order to achieve momentum and speed. I believe that this is, yep, depicted on the front page. There we go, and we're, we're heading towards the quintain. And we're having a great time. Kay seems to register your disappointment as you descend the stairs. What? Do you think I was going to get Bishop out for this? Bishop is the name of Sir Ector's charger, a fine warhorse who has seen many a battle and bears the scars to prove it. It is enough that the whelp promised to do my chores for a fortnight in exchange for this favor. Arthur looks abashed. Clearly, he did not want Kay to mention this part of the deal. Being an older squire of 17 winters, Arthur has many responsibilities already. Taking on Kay's tasks will mean long hours and sore limbs. And now we get to a section where it gives us some instructions. In a situation like this, where it may not be clear how best to respond, you may turn to your traits for guidance. As long as the trait is less than 16, you are always free to choose how to act. However, let us see what the dice have to say this time. This is called a decision roll and has you rolling against two usually opposing traits. It is usually obvious which traits to roll against once you become familiar with their definitions. In this case, look to your just and arbitrary traits. Someone with a high value in just... I got this. <laughs> Someone with a high value in just has developed an objective sense of right and wrong while an arbitrary person allows their own biases or self-interest to influence their feelings. Take 1d20, I have it from the starter, okay, and roll against the value of your just trait first. If you roll equal to or less than the value you are said to have succeeded in that trait, rolling the value of the trait exactly is called a critical success, while rolling a 20 is called a fumble. All right, so my just trait is 10. Hua, Ooh, not a fumble, but definitely a failure. <laughs> uh, if you rolled a critical success, put a check next to just on your character sheet. If you fumbled the roll, put a check next to arbitrary instead, as a fumble in one trade is considered an automatic success in the other. If you failed your roll against just, make a second roll against arbitrary. As with just, a critical success here grants a check to arbitrary and a fumble grants a check to the opposite trait and is considered a successful just roll. So once again, we're rolling on 10 and I rolled a six. So I was successful on arbitrary. If you choose or succeeded at arbitrary, go to four. All right. K 
Kay is your elder and much bigger than you. You are well acquainted with his temper and you know that saying something right now could set him off. You really do not want to risk losing out on this opportunity, so you remain silent. Besides, Alice has come out on the landing and is watching keenly. It would be a shame to disappoint her. Right, let's get this over with. Oh, sorry, I'm Kay's voice here. Right, let's get this over with says Kay, as he hefts a lance and hands it to you. Get up on the saddle and the whelp and I will pull you. Uh, go to five. The lance, lathed from fine ash wood, is more than twice your height, and you must set it against the wooden hobby horse to clamber into the saddle. As you take it up and feel the weight in your hands, you set your eyes on the quintain target. Arthur and Kay laugh as they pick up the ropes attached to the front of the horse. They are both accustomed to the intricacies of horsemanship and lance practice, so for them this is all a folly. But you are in earnest. You hear Alice give an encouraging call as the two squires heave to and the horse rolls forward. The small wooden wheels skip along over the uneven turf and all you can do, excuse me, is try to keep yourself in the saddle. You are moving fast now and the quintain is getting closer. You start to lower your lance, throwing off your sense of balance. You cannot believe how much the tip is wobbling. And then, well, before we continue, I need to partake of my cuppa. I know that there are many of you in the audience who live in the UK are probably getting a, a great laugh out of my pronunciation and accent. And that's fine because I'm just a Midwestern boy here in the central United States. <clears throat> Born and raised. Make an unopposed charge roll to see how you fare. To do this, roll 1d20 and compare the result to your charge skill as you did with your trait roll. Remember that rolling the exact value of your charge skill is a critical success, while rolling a 20 is a fumble. Okay, here we go. Charge skill is 9. Oh, failure. If you fail, go to 9. Okay. Spoiler art here, I guess. Try as you might, you cannot get the lance under control. It moves with a mind of its own, it seems, and you watch, powerless as the cloth-covered tip hits nothing but air. The disc turns lazily in the breeze caused by your passing. Unlucky, Alice shouts from the landing, but Kay laughs. Luck has nothing... Oh my gosh. See, now, I, see, now I've decided to do voices, and I'm going to have to do consistent voices. You, you reap what you sow. Luck has nothing to do with it, he chortles. It is a test of skill, he continues, laying a meaty hand heavily on your shoulder, of which you have none. He throws his head back, braying with laughter at his own witticism. Go to 17. Without warning, the air is split with the blast of a horn. Your petty concerns and squabbles pop like a soap bubble as you all turn to see the lord of the manor, Sir Ector, riding up from the village of Kergai, his household knight, Sir Jonas, riding behind him. Most knights in Britain serve in the household of a lord, thus their name. They are also called bachelor knights from Bas Chevalier, low knight. They are uh, nonetheless members of the nobility, and to reach even the rank puts one in an exclusive group of warriors sworn to defend those who cannot defend themselves and pledge their swords to the service of a nobleman or lady. Sir Ector, an aging knight, looks to be in good humor. He reins his horse to a halt near to where you are practicing and hops down. I have word that our king, Mawen, and his court are to pay us a visit in two days' time to stay with us through the Feast of St. Andrew. Tomorrow we go a-hunting for boar. The king must have a grand feast of welcome when he arrives. Quintain practice is over. A boar hunt is always an event that requires the support of the full household. And you, Alice, Kay, and Arthur rush to follow Ector into the hall and find out what is expected of you. Go to 18. Today marks a week before the Feast of St. Andrew, and the morning dawns chill and gray. You rise from your customary bed, a soft pile of straw in the corner of the hall that you share with the other pages, and help the squires get the hearth fire stoked up among other menial tasks. Cuppa. Ah. 
Sir Ector is also up and moving about, preparing for the hunt in consultation with Sir Jonas. Hunting is Ector's favorite sport, and he employs a huntsman, a gnarled old, spe- old specimen called Glynn, to help him in his efforts. Glynn is up in the hall at dawn, along with Di, the dog boy, to discuss the day's prospects. Considering the season, all agree that Boar will be most likely quarry, but they will not know for certain until they see the tokens. The hunt, you have gathered, has a lexicon all its own, with words like unharboring, fumes, a bay, and so forth. Although you have seen many hunts set out from Ector's Hall, this is to be the first time you are invited along on one, and your stomach is far too unsettled to take the bread and small ale on offer for the morning's fast-breaking. Arrangements are made, and the hunting party assembles outside the hall. The knights and squires are dressed in their gambesons, thickly quilted cloth armor that provides some small protection against the beasts of the wild. I love me some beasts of the field. Each carries a special spear called a boar spear, which features a long, sharp iron head and a sturdy metal crosspiece positioned about 18 inches down the shaft and intended to prevent the wild boar from running up the spear and goring the hunter. Sir Ector has spun fireside tales of companions lost to the savagery of the boar and its razor-sharp tusks, and your blood runs cold as you think of what it would take to bring down such a wild beast. Uh, Fun fact, uh, boars are... Uh, nearly at the top of my personal list of animals that I would not want to encounter in the wild. Um, And uh, probably here in the United States, cougar would be the next one. Um, You're more likely to encounter black bears here in the central United States, not usually at all where I live in Nebraska, but in Northwestern U S absolutely. Um, And then you go extreme Northwest and you get grizzlies or brown bears. And that's when you are really in trouble. Um, Do you, do you all want to hear my, my bear joke? I'm going to tell you it right now. Um, What is the difference between encountering a black bear and a brown bear? Um, If you encounter a black bear, the, you run up a tree and the black bear climbs the tree and eats you. And if you encounter a grizzly bear, the grizzly bear uh, knocks down the tree that you climbed up and eats you. <clears throat> you walk alongside Die, who has his hands full, managing the estate's pack of bang running hounds. To your other side lopes uh, Aron, the great shaggy Q, or wolfhound, who is a great favorite of everyone in Ector's household. He is as big as you, but as gentle as a lamb. His presence reassures you, for he is as brave and true as any noble knight. The air is fresh from the rains overnight. As you And as you walk across the vale, the clouds begin breaking up, allowing some golden sunlight through. To the east, you see golden rays reflecting off the surface of Lynn Teget, the mighty lake that forms the headwaters of the River Dee. It is said that beneath it waves... Beneath its waves lies a sunken city, and some nights you can see the lights of the buildings down in the depths. That's what Kay is. That's what Kay has always claimed, at least. You and Arthur have snuck out a few times, but haven't seen anything so far. Aside from the scattered towns and villages and their farm and pasture lands... On Sir Ector's estate, most of the vale is light woodland, and you are making for one such patch of forest now. Glynn and his assistants from Care Guy got a head start earlier, and you see them approach bearing the fumes, excrement, of a boar inside the rim of their hunting horns, go to 19. So, um, initial reflections, um, I'm enjoying that we're, uh, uh, telling an an interesting story here. It's definitely an interesting story. I don't like the fact that we're, we're going three huge entries in a row without having to make a decision. Um, and so hopefully that's going to be happening here at 19. Sir Ector dismounts and confers with Glynn the hunter about the best approaches, the location of the boar's lair, and so forth. The air is electric with anticipation. Kay approaches you. See, he, You see he is holding a sausage link. He tears it apart with his teeth and offers you half. You should eat something. Hunts can last all day. Kay does have his moments of compassion. As you eat, he explains the different calls of the huntsman's horn, how it is used to gather the hounds, to signal the other hunters, and to to announce the death of the quarry, in addition to sundry other uses. Every knight and squire carries a horn, for hunts often range over vast distances, and it is easy to get separated. Arthur has drifted over during the conversation, uh, as well, listening to Kay while leaning against a spear. 
what I will say here is that I like that I'm learning things about the time period. Uh, this is supposed to be taking place in uh, fifth century Britain. Um, and there is a little bit of, you know, license that ha that is happening here. Um, mounted joust was not really a thing during this time. Um, but, you know, it, we're, we're telling stories here, so it's all good. <clears throat> you should stick nearby to me and Sir Hector, says Kay. If you get separated, just listen for our call. Once we've taken the boar, you will help bring it back to the hole. Just then, Glynn signals the finding, the opening stage of the hunt, where the beast is unharbored and the chase begins. I like how the words are used in context here. That's that's good writing. The hounds set up a tremendous racket and nearly pull Di off his feet as they begin moving towards the woods. The knights mount up and Kay and Arthur rush towards their horses as well before Arthur stops, turns, and hands his spear to you. In case you run into any trouble, he says, his face grim, you feel a wave of gratitude wash over you. It is not as sophisticated as the knight's boar spears, but it's better than nothing. Okay, we have a box on success and failure. Refer back to this page if you forget what some of the various die roll outcomes mean. In Pendragon, there are two types of rolls, unopposed and opposed. Unopposed rolls are a single d20 roll against one of your statistics. You roll your roll will either succeed or fail. If you roll the value of the statistic exactly, this is a critical success. If you roll a 20, this is a fumble, unless your statistic is also 20. Opposed rolls involve two d20 rolls against two statistic. Each roll is read the same as an unopposed roll, then the results are compared. If you succeed and your opponent fails, or if you both succeed but your die roll value is higher, this is a win. If your opponent succeeds and you fail, this is a loss. If you succeed but your opponent's die roll value is higher than yours, this is a partial success. If you both fail, this is a mutual failure. If you both roll the same value on the dice or both score a critical success, this is a tie. Gripping the spear, you break into a trot on foot, keeping up as the knights canter towards the woods. Soon you are among the trees, the dead leaves of autumn crunching softly beneath your shoes. The bracken and branches are not so bad here, and you keep an eye on the knights as they press ahead. Dogs and huntsmen in the lead. It is not long before you hear a blast from Glynn's horn. The quarry is found and the chase is on. You see signs of movement deeper in the woods and go that way. Your breath ragged in your throat and coming out in great white puffs. More horn blasts, now from multiple hunters. Dogs barking and howling, echoing among the trees. Shouts fading into the distance. You look around. You are all alone. Make an opposed roll of your hunting skill versus the boar's, boar's avoidance skill of ten. You are trying to both succeed at your own roll and roll better than the boar's outcome if he succeeds at his avoidance roll. This is called winning the roll. If you and the boar both succeed, but he rolls better than you, then this is a partial success. If you fail, your roll and the boar succeeds, this is a loss. If you both fail your rolls, this is mutual failure, and rolling a 20 means you have fumbled your roll. For this opposed roll, there is no penalty if you fail or use your, lose your skill roll, apart from the simple consequences of failing, failing, but this is not always the case. So let's do this. My hunting skill is a five. Okay, I elected not to put points into that to my own demise. This may be a record for fewest number of successes in, in one of my uh, solo quest videos. Anyway, so I'm going to roll for my hunting skill first, needing a five or under. Oh, and look, I got a critical failure. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, now we will roll for the boar's avoidance roll of 10. The boar fails. Okay. Um, so lots of different choices. If you fumble, go to 46. So we're going to pause here and we're going to see the outcome of this fumble on 46 on the next part of the video, because we want to have these in sizable, uh, appropriately sized chunks for us to do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn to the page that has 46 and I'm going to mark it with my character sheet so I know where we are. And in part two, we will continue our adventure into 
book one of Solo Quest for Pendragon, The Adventure of the Sword and the Stone. I hope you enjoyed it, folks. Uh, let me know your insights in the comments below, and uh, I will have another video for part two coming out soon. Have a great day.